Oops. Greetings, folks. This is Stephen Rahm. I'm the Chief of the Office of Clinical Direction and Co-Chair for the Center for Emergency Health Sciences. We are located uh, just a stone's throw away from Stephen, Stephen, I can't hear you. And I could hear just fine on my end. Oh. I could hear too. That's weird. Okay. Take two. Okay. Before I do that, Ellie, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. All right. And away we go. I'm going to count to five and then I'm going to start. Greetings, everyone. This is Steve Rahm from the Center for Emergency Health Sciences. I'm the Chief of the Office of Clinical Direction for the Center, and we're located uh, a little bit northeast of San Antonio, Texas. It is my honor and pleasure to be here uh, with you folks for the South Dakota EMS Association Conference 2020 virtual, and it is my sincere hope that we will all be able to congregate together and meet face-to-face -face next year. Never been to South Dakota, and I would love to come up there and, uh, and visit you uh, very, very fine folks. We're gonna talk about thoracic trauma in this presentation, and I call it the emergent truth, uh, partly because uh, it's my hope that I'm gonna to try to dispel some mythology, specifically as it relates to anatomy in uh, thoracic injury and its relevance to the procedures that we're gonna be performing on folks who have what I would consider, and I think what anybody would consider to be preventable causes of death. So if we, look at, uh, if we look at what's happening on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places around the world, the three leading causes of preventable death in this order, first is massive hemorrhage, second is airway inadequacy, and third is tension pneumothorax. And it's, it's that third component that we're gonna focus in on here today. We talked about blood, we've talked about some airway issues. We're gonna talk about thoracic trauma we're going to talk about some signs and symptoms. We're going to talk about clinical management. And all of this is based on the latest science and the way that we should be doing things. But we need to actually visit the way things are being done in certain areas and how we can perhaps kind of work together to, to kind of fix these problems. So anyway, uh, this is the Center for Emergency Health Sciences where I work. You can see we keep uh, um, just a tad busy. Um, uh, COVID earlier in the year kind of slowed things down a little bit for us, but I tell you, things have picked up with a vengeance, and we are just getting all kinds of folks that are coming up here. Of note, uh, we had Warren Buffett's bodyguards in our lab a couple of months ago. Um, they all looked like they just wanted to kill me, um, so I just kind of kept my distance. We even had Taylor Swift's bodyguards up there before. They, uh, they were not kind enough to bring Taylor up there, but they were all retired Navy SEALs. They all looked like they wanted to do me great bodily harm as well. But nonetheless, it was an honor having them up here. So that's just a little bit of, uh, of what we do in, in just the educational realm and the R&D world and the research world and just all kinds of stuff. So thoracic trauma. Um, this is kind of our, our menu or our agenda. We're going to talk anatomy, and, and that's perhaps probably the most important part of this whole conversation is, is resetting the anatomy in our brains and getting rid of some of this mythology of the way we think things look, when the reality is that, I'll give you an example. I am five foot eight, and I weigh 165 pounds. If you were to stand another man right next to me who was also five foot eight, but added 400 pounds to him, then once you get through the epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue, we would be identical. And I do mean identical. Our lungs would be the same size. Our heart would be the same size. There would be nothing about us that's different. And that is a critical part of what we need to figure out and kind of reset in our minds. When we're taking care of people who are rather large, we just need to remember inside that large human, there is a little human, right? So it's not how big we get horizontally, it's how big we get vertically. So it's my hope that we kind of mis dispel some of that mythology so we can start figuring this out. And we're going to talk about some critical assessment parameters that apply across the spectrum of all chest injuries. And then we're going to focus in on some lethal injuries in terms of their assessment and best practices for management and how, if untreated, that can just create a ripple effect and effectively put your patient into what I call a death vortex from which they may not be able to recover. So reality versus mythology. I'm still looking for that creature on the right. It's kind of like Sasquatch, you know, maybe it's out there, maybe it's not, but I can tell you it's not in medicine. 
when you're taking care of a patient, and, and this doesn't just apply to thoracic injuries, this applies to patients in general, your patients need you to look through their external anatomy and they need you to see this. Now, if you look through their external anatomy and see that, this would be an embalmed specimen and that's really not what we wanna see. We wanna see something that looks like this. Your patients need you to see this. It's critical that they see that, that you see this because if you get distracted by epidermis, dermis and tons of subcutaneous tissue, then quite frankly, your patient's gonna die where they lay. You need to be able to look through the anatomy and see what you really need to be putting a needle into or putting a chest, in, a chest tube into or any other medical procedure that you can ever imagine doing must be able to see through that. So a little anatomical perspective. So this was an image that we shot in our lab and, and kind of a, on a humorous note, we actually have a corresponding video for this where the, uh, the specimen you can see, we've done just a full um, uh, chest plate removal and uh, we intubated the, the specimen and we were ventilating the specimen and we were teaching this at a conference and uh, a young man raised his hand and he asked, he goes, so was this woman breathing on her own? And I'm like, okay, I'll play along. And I said, oh, absolutely. We do this all the time. People come up there, let us take their chest plates off. And he got this really weird look on his face. And then he realized I was joking. So the answer is no, the, the specimen was not breathing. But if you look at this image in front of you right here, so they have their fingers on the clavicle. And, and for you guys in the audience, I want you to do that. I want you to put your finger on your clavicle. And then I want you to take your thumb and I want you to run it down your mid axillary line and I want you to keep feeling ribs and just keep feeling down and keep feeling down and keep feeling down until you feel the last rib that you can feel. So in this picture right here, they have identified the superior and the inferior borders of the thoracic cavity. But in relation to that very broad area of real estate, you see where the lungs actually sit. They're way up high. In fact, the apices of your lungs, a portion of the apices of your lungs actually go underneath your clavicles. So that brings up point number one, which is more of an assessment point. If you're listening for breast sounds right here, congratulations, my friend, you're listening over the liver. And the last time I checked the literature, the liver does not make any noise. If you're listening for breast sounds way down here, you're listening over the spleen. And again, the spleen does not make any noise. So if you do me a favor, if you grab your pectoralis muscle right here and just kind of dig your fingers in where you feel ribs, where you feel ribs, that's where your stethoscope should be going when you're listening for breast sounds emergently, right? So I'm talking about confirming proper tube placement. I'm talking about determining whether or not that patient is actually moving air into their lungs or whether or not you're trying to make the determination as to whether or not you should put a needle in somebody's chest. Because above all, you should be moving air in your apices of your lungs. And then tuck nice and neat behind your lungs, that would be your heart. So when you look at this picture right here, think of the way that we were created. We were created to breathe based upon a vacuum. And that vacuum is generated when our diaphragm contracts and our inter, uh, intercostal muscles contract. And that enlarges the dimensions of our thoracic cavity. That creates a vacuum. That vacuum pulls air into your lungs, right? That's called negative pressure ventilation. That's the way we normally breathe. But that same vacuum that pulls air into your lungs also pulls blood back to the right side of your heart. So when you think about it, it's like, man, the man upstairs who created us was pretty darn smart. He said, we're gonna have you breathe. We're gonna have you breathe primarily to off-gas carbon dioxide, but we'll also have you breathe in some oxygen because we can function with little oxygen, you know, comparatively speaking, but we're also gonna energize that negative pressure vacuum to pull more blood back to your heart. So negative pressure ventilation, in addition to eliminating CO2, in addition to breathing in oxygen, pulls blood back to the right side of your heart. That's all fine and dandy when you're breathing on your own. But the moment you stop breathing on your own and we now have to push air into your lungs, we are totally changing that physiologic dynamic. We're no longer creating vacuum in your chest. We are building up pressure in your chest. 
And if you overdo ventilating a patient, say for example, you're ventilating them at a rate that's too fast, you're ventilating with too much volume, you're gonna start crushing the heart because you're hyperinflating the lungs. So that in turn is going to impair venous return and essentially cause a refill problem. So the next time you're ventilating a human, you need to make sure that you are just generating normal, right? You don't need your patient to breathe 30 times a minute and deep. If they weren't breathing that way before their crisis, why would you breathe for them that way during their crisis? I'm talking about a nice, slow squeeze of the bag over about one, one and a half seconds. Just watch for perceptible chest rise and just let go of the bag and don't squeeze it again for another five or six seconds. Because if you're, if you're bagging the patient in synchrony with your stress level, then you have fallen prey to this condition called bagycardia, or over in the UK, they call it tachybagia. You're crushing the patient's heart and that has direct negative hemodynamic effects. Truth be told, positive pressure ventilation is the enemy of cardiac output. So when you're having to ventilate a patient, just do it responsibly, okay? Chest does not like positive pressure. So in the big scheme of things, when you're taking care of a patient who has any injury above the pelvis and below the neck, aptly called thoracoabdominal trauma, and, and, and part of your assessment, it needs to be thorough because no stone unturned. You're looking for evidence of external injury. You're looking for symmetry of the chest wall, for example, both sides of the chest should move equally. If one side of the chest is not moving as well as the other, then you're either dealing with a pneumothorax or if there's a bulging section of chest, then that would tell me that that section of the chest is no longer connected to the rest of the thoracic cavity and you probably have a flail chest. You're looking at work of breathing. If a patient literally gets the wind knocked out of them, they will recover from that. But when you're talking about work of breathing, you're looking for progressive respiratory distress. You're looking for respiratory distress that is getting worse and worse and worse. That's telling you that something bad is brewing in the thoracic cavity. And then of course, you're listening for breath sounds at the places that we just identified. Now I get it. Sometimes we're in a really, really loud environment. You're on the side of a major highway. It's at night. There's traffic whizzing by. Maybe the jaws of life is humming. And it may be difficult to hear breath sounds. That's okay. Just look for their work of breathing, look for chest wall symmetry, look for external injury and let that increase your index of suspicion. I put a big maybe by your jugular veins because jugular venous distension may or may not be, be appreciable depending on how big or how small your patient is. For example, JVD in an infant, it just ain't gonna happen because their head sits on top of their shoulders or patients that are rather, rather large, very, very thick necks, that may not be an appreciable sign, right? To, to properly assess for jugular vein distension, your patient has to be sitting at a 45 degree angle. If you lay anybody down flat, then naturally blood is gonna to start to move towards their head and that in itself is gonna distend their jugular veins. So if they have JVD at a 45 degree angle, that tells you systemic venous pressure is increased, which means they have a refill problem. Something is preventing venous return. So, but nonetheless, I include that as a maybe because you may see it, but you may not. And then of course your other things that you're looking for to, to, to generally assess the overall degree of perfusion, pulse rate and quality and regularity, skin color condition and temperature, their oxygen saturation, and of course their end tidal CO2. If your patient's respiratory system is failing, whether it's from a medical etiology or a trauma etiology, and their respiratory system cannot effectively eliminate that carbon dioxide waste of metabolism, then they're gonna start increasing their end tidal CO2. All of these, any one of these in combination are big, big red flags. So this is clearly a very classical seatbelt injury pattern. But if you look at this patient, you see the obvious, but you don't see the not so obvious. And it's oftentimes the most obvious that can be the least life-threatening. Many chest injuries are occult, which means they're not openly or readily available for you to see. But this would increase my index of suspicion from a clavicular injury all the way down through the intestine and everything in between. So I'm thinking just by looking at this picture, now mind you, this was not a patient I took care of, clearly a seatbelt pattern, but this kind of looks suspicious like his chest may have collided with a steering wheel. So I'm all of a sudden worried about not just 
bony fractures. I'm not just worried about abdominal injuries. I'm worried about cardiac contusion. I'm worried about cardiac tamponade. I'm worried about hemothorax. I'm worried about pneumothorax. I'm worried about tension pneumothorax. We've had patients with injury patterns that looked almost just like this that were walking around saying, no, 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 no. I don't want to go to the hospital. Man, this is a high, high, high risk refusal. And you should go to the ends of the earth to convince this patient to go to the hospital. If they still don't want to go, just get your medical director on the phone. Sometimes they can pull that doctor stuff and tell the patient stuff that we may have not have thought to tell them. At all costs, you really need to get these patients to the hospital. <coughs> Excuse me. We talked about this March assessment and other uh, presentations that I've given through this conference. We're going to revisit it again. We have to make sure that we have a rapid systematic approach. I think all of us at one time or another have taken ITLS or PHTLS, if there are some RNs here, maybe you've taken TNCC, we've all taken the AHA courses and they all teach assessments. Your patient doesn't care which assessment approach you use. They just want you to be systematic they want you to be methodical and they want you to be expedient. This March assessment enables you to be all three of those. Find what's gonna kill them, fix it, and then move on. Address massive hemorrhage aggressively. If a patient is laying there and they're bleeding from a compressible source, in other words, a source that we could stop, they shouldn't just lay there and bleed to death. So we got to fix that. If they have any airway problems, fix them. It may be a simple fix like nasal airways, or it could be something as radical as a cricothyrotomy. Then their respirations. It's somewhere between the M and the R that I'm thinking about whether or not I should put a needle in your chest. If you're not squirting blood, but right off the bat, I notice you're working hard to breathe and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I look at your chest and it's kind of asymmetrical. Well, guess what folks? A tension pneumothorax does not resolve on its own. It doesn't resolve any more than anaphylactic shock. It resolves when you either put a needle in somebody's chest to evacuate that pleural tension, or it resolves when your patient goes into cardiac arrest. And obviously the latter is simply not an option. Then circulation. You just care that your patient has central and peripheral pulses. You can get a blood pressure later. There's no room for blood pressure in this rapid march assessment. And then finally, the hypothermic element. Keep your patients warm. If they're bleeding internally and they get cold, they're just gonna keep bleeding. And it's almost like a patient who's taking blood thinners, really. The colder you get, the more coagulopathic you get, the more you bleed. And that's especially relevant when we're taking care of somebody who has a non-compressible hemorrhage, like an intrathoracic or an intra-abdominal hemorrhage. We want to create the most favorable environment so they can continue to compensate. All right, let's talk about an open pneumothorax, aka a sucking chest wound. So sometimes um, somebody um, usually somebody that was not the nicest person um, did us the solid of putting a big hole in the patient's chest before we got there. And that is simply an open pneumothorax or a sucking chest wound. Now, if somebody put an ice pick through my chest wall, that's not going to create a sucking chest wound because in order for that, that air to preferentially suck in and out of my chest cavity as opposed to my nose and mouth, that hole has to be a pretty good size and essentially has to be about two thirds the diameter of your trachea. So I'm talking about the big holes, right? The big holes where you may see blood bubbling. You may actually hear a sucking sound coming from the patient's chest. Hey, if you see any open chest injury, there's nothing wrong with just putting an occlusive dressing over it. Whether you carry a, a commercial chest seal, I'll show you some alternatives to commercial chest seals because not everybody may carry them. But that's what a sucking chest wound is. This is an injury that was discovered in a trauma bay because the medic crew never looked at the patient's back. Never. That's a big, that's the sucking chest wound from Hades, my friends, and it was totally missed in the pre-hospital setting. And they were wondering why this patient was not getting better. First of all, this is a professional embarrassment, but most importantly, we missed a life-threatening injury. Missed a life-threatening injury. So during your March assessment, at some point, you have got to get that patient on his or her side and completely sweep the back because there are ribs around the back and there's lungs underneath those ribs. And wherever there's lung and rib, there can be an open chest injury. So please, 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 I implore you, check the back. 
Here's the sucking chest from a little video I'm gonna play for you. This came out of Operation Iraqi Freedom. So I was actually quite impressed when I saw this, like they actually made that three-sided ta uh, tape thing work, right? They just put some, uh, maybe it was a, an adaptic or something like that, but you can see here. So first thing I tell is yes, you're definitely a cigarette smoker because I can see that black lung, but look at where this injury is at. I mean, it's a wonder this man is alive. It really is. It's a wonder this man is alive because by all rights, man, it should have taken out everything, but it did create a ventilation problem for him. So you find an open chest injury, your next order of business is to close that chest injury. Occlusive dressing, if it's the first wound found, it's the first wound treated, and then you're going to assess for and cover any additional open wounds and then continually monitor their respiratory effort. And there's that key word again, progressive. This is an easy fix, right? If you've covered a big sucking chest wound, and now your patient may be breathing a little bit easier, but then they start working hard to breathe and then their entitled CO2 starts going up and then their SATs start going down. They start becoming a little bit more tachycardic. Just burp the dressing, just take it off, release that pleural tension and then cover the occlusive dressing back up again. Easy problem to fix. Don't try to stick needles through your occlusive dressing because you're, you're overthinking it at that point. Just take the occlusive dressing off and do the proverbial burping of the wound. There are a lot of different occlusive dressings out here. I don't endorse any one of them. In fact, my favorite chest seal in the world would be the one that would effectively cover my sucking chest wound. It's kind of like my favorite tourniquet in the world. And oh, they make over 30 tourniquets that are out there. My favorite tourniquet is the one that would stop y'all's bleeding and would stop my bleeding. Just like my favorite helicopter, the one that keeps flying, right? So whether it's an Asherman or it's a Halo or it's a hyphen, any one of these will work. I'll tell you that hyphen chest seal, that's like flypaper. You stick that sucker on somebody's chest and you have to make a deliberate effort to remove it. But let's say that you don't have any of these. And there are some EMS agencies, rural EMS agencies that don't have a lot of budgetary dollars to spend. And they're like, we don't have chest seals. I'm like, oh, but you do. They're called defib pads, right? Just take the pads out of your AED and cut the wires off and slap that on their chest because that thing has some gel on it and that will act effectively as an occlusive dressing. We're good at improvising, adapting, and overcoming. So just make something work. You can tell I like Chris Farley right here. Um, immediate pleural tension relief is just remove the occlusive dressing. Well, what happens if you do that and you don't get any air that escapes? Well, sometimes that blood can clot and close that open chest wound, you may have to carefully, and I say carefully, place your finger in that wound and try to pop that plug out of there to allow that air to continue to escape. But for the love of God, burp the wound, just burp the wound. This is all great when your patient's breathing on his or her own. So let's say that you get to a scene patient has sucking chest wound, you do your due regard and you cover it with occlusive dressing and you're monitoring and you're burping PRN. But then it becomes necessary to ventilate your patient. So now your patient's no longer breathing on their own or they're just not doing it well enough on their own. If you're gonna introduce any kind of positive pressure, that chest seal is gonna have to come off and it's gonna have to stay off. Because if you keep it on, after about four or five positive pressure breaths, they will tension up on you and they will start to become very, very hemodynamically stable. So simply put, they're breathing on their own, chest seal, just burp at PRN. You have to ventilate them, chest seal is gonna have to come off. A tension pneumothorax, when I think of a tension pneumothorax, which is a refill problem, it's primarily a refill problem. Let me elaborate on that. Imagine the heart as being this big grape and that grape is suspended in your chest by this big vine. And that vine is your superior and your inferior vena cava. So if you look at this injury on the, on, this would be on the patient's right. You're looking at all this pleural tension that's starting to collapse that lung. What's going to happen is that grape is going to get kinked on that vine, which basically means your vena cava get kinked. Now you have no conduit to return venous blood to the right side of your heart. The right side of the heart feeds the left side of the heart and the left side of the heart only gets what the right side feeds it. So if there's nothing coming back to the left, 
there's nothing going to be feed to, uh, I'm sorry, if there's nothing coming back from the right, there's nothing to feed to the left. That's why these patients become physiologically unstable. So we need to get air and tension out of that injured side and unkink that big grape on that vine. That is an imminently treatable injury. It is a totally preventable cause of death. We just need to be able to recognize those signs and symptoms really quickly. And you see them up here and they're numerable. I apologize, this is a busy slide. The sole reason why I put this slide up here is because I wanted to line through tracheal deviation. Now we've always been taught that tracheal deviation is a late finding in a tension pneumothorax. That part actually is true. However, this is not a sign that you are gonna see in the pre-hospital setting. And the reason why is because when the trachea swings to the contralateral side, it does so around the carina and you can't see the carina. When we do all of these anterior neck dissections in the lab, we quickly appreciate all of the connective tissue that is literally gluing the trachea in place. So in a tension pneumo, the trachea does not deviate up here, it deviates way down here. Quite frankly, I wouldn't even waste time looking at the trachea. I would look for a mechanism that suggests thoracic trauma. I would look for symmetry of the chest wall. I would monitor SpO2, entitl CO2, and look for progressive respiratory distress. So I'll show you some examples of tracheal deviation that actually occurred, but you see them on a chest X-ray, and here's one of them. So the patient has a big, this would be their left, okay? Because you're always looking at in reverse. So this is a big tension pneumo on the left. All of this is air. The lung is totally collapsed. Here's the trachea right here. You see how midline it is up here where we would normally be looking for it? The trachea swings well below in the thoracic cavity because the trachea goes down, goes back behind the heart. So you would not see this in the pre-hospital setting. So we kind of need to, undo. that's part of that mythology. We kind of need to undo that. I mean, if you want to look at somebody's trachea, if their trachea is truly deviated, then they probably took a direct blow to their trachea and separated a lot of that connective tissue and pushed the trachea away, in which case now they have an imminent airway problem. Here's another tension pneumothorax. You can barely see the outline, <coughs> excuse me, you can barely see the outline of the lung on the patient's left side. And all that tracheal tension, here's that trachea that swung contralateral, but look how nice and midline it is up here. So please don't, don't bank um, your diagnosis on the presence or absence of tracheal deviation, because quite frankly, you ain't going to see it, okay? Here's a big tension pneumothorax on the patient's right that's caused a mediastinal shift to the left. So imagine that big old grape, the heart, is this, this kinking, that vena cava is being kinked, that patient is getting no venous return, which means they're, they're getting no left ventricular output. So when we see jugular vein distension on these patients, it's because their venous return can't return to the right atrium, so it's going to start backing up. And if your patient is in the proper position and they're not too, not, you know, they're not a baby, they're not really too obese, then you'll, you'll see the jugular vein start to, to engorge. That's because of, of, of increased systemic venous pressure or increased jugular venous uh, pressure. But again, that may or may not be present. If you're in an area where it's too noisy to hear breath sounds, either because of the ambient noise or, or, or multiple other factors. If that patient has asymmetric chest movement, progressive respiratory distress, and their oxygen saturation is staying low, despite the fact that you're giving them high flow oxygen, you should put a needle in the side of the chest that's not moving so well. It's great if you can hear breath sounds and appreciate, hey, there are no breath sounds over here. And if you're in an environment where you can do that, you absolutely should. But sometimes we just don't have that nice, quiet environment. This brings us to what is truly and actually what's only gonna save this patient's life. And that is to put a needle into the intrathoracic cavity, specifically the pleural cavity, to be able to drain that air out of there, release that pleural tension, allow that mediastinum to reshift midline and take all the pressure off the great vessels. But if you look at this little diagram right here, on the inferior border of every rib, there's a vascular bundle. There's a little nerve, a little artery, and a little vein. So that means we always want to avoid the underside of the rib. I read a case report a couple of months ago of a young boy that fractured one rib. He broke one rib and lost almost two liters of blood into his thoracic cavity. 
from a single rib fracture because he tore that whole little vascular bundle right here. I don't want to hit this with a needle because that's just going to bleed and bleed and bleed. And guess what? You can't stop that bleeding. So great. You may have gotten air out of their chest, but now you created a hemophorax and that can only be fixed with blood and a surgeon. So you always want to make sure that your needle is navigated over the rib. And you have to make sure that you're in the correct anatomic place as well. Here was a paper that was published and it talked about the standard 4.4 centimeter angiocath is likely to be unsuccessful in 50% of trauma patients based on their body habits. So what does this tell us? It means we need a needle of larger caliber and we need a longer needle because putting an 18 gauge into the thoracic cavity of a patient who weighs 300 pounds, you will be through fat and you will have not even come close to touching the rib. And that's one thing that we found when we've done studies is how far from the time that I put that needle against your rib, how much further do I need to go? Well, we found that we believe that the average depth, in other words, from rib to parietal pleura is between 1.8 and 2.3 centimeters. I think we'd all agree that the amount of fat that you have on your chest is highly variable but it's not the fat that matters because we all agree that it's not how big you get this way, it's how big you get you know, vertically. So once you get through all that fatty tissue, once you get that needle on the chest, you only need to be one inch further, that's it. Don't ever bury a needle in somebody's chest because some of these catheters are so long and I do not have a big chest. If you were doing a lateral decompression on me and you buried that needle, I guarantee you, you would puncture my left ventricle and I would probably tend to get a little bit angry with you. Great, you got the air out, but now you punctured my heart and I'm bleeding in my chest. These are some of the devices that are out there. Um, again, I'm not pitching any of them, but I must tell you, feel my responsibility, this device up here has been recalled. This device has been recalled because this little stopper right here um, was getting plugged or was getting caught. And this is called a varus needle. So you see this little protective sheath right over here, and that's what keeps that needle retracted back in that device. This whole thing is stainless steel. So it's designed to be pushed through the, the, the fatty tissue. And when you touch the rib, this little protective sheath retracts and it exposes the needle. And then you go into the chest, you release the tension out of the chest, and then it's designed to be removed. Now, fundamentally, that does not make any sense to me because if I put a catheter in your chest, I want air to continually escape your pleural space. I don't want to put something in there, get some air out, pull it out, and then have you tension right back up again. But nonetheless, this device has been recalled because this little stopper right here was getting occluded, which means you were getting no air release. This lower left example, whoops, let me back up. This lower left example, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. This lower left example, this is the Cook catheter, and it's a 14 gauge, and it has this built-in Heimlich valve. And the catheter itself has like some wire mesh in it that kind of helps it from, uh, to prevent it from collapsing and, and help it from kinking. But the problem is it's a 14 gauge. And 14 gauges we found are probably still too small in terms of caliber. If your patient's a, a 10 year old male, a 14 gauge is gonna work fine. If your patient's a 40 year old male, then a 14 gauge, it's gonna get air out of there, but it may not get air out of there as fast as you want it to. Up here in the upper right, this is the air release system, um, but it's also a 14 gauge. They also make a 10 gauge, and that's now what we're talking. We're talking a 10 gauge. That's something that we want. The lower right example is also a 14 gauge. This is a device that we created in our lab. Disclaimer, we make no money off of it. We created it, we made it better, and we, we sold the patent for $1. So we don't make any money off. It's called the SPEAR, the Simplified Pneumothorax Emergency Air Release. We made some very specific modifications to it. The first thing we did is we put, we couldn't call this a lure lock because the term lure lock is a proprietary term. So we called it a slip lock. It connects the catheter and the needle assembly together. And that's, that's one of the problems with using a device where there's nothing connecting the needle to the catheter, you would have to hold the catheter, I'm gonna grab my pen, you would have to hold the catheter and the needle together like this, because if you just held the catheter and you pushed it down, the needle would push out of the top of the catheter, and then that's where catheters kink. 
So we fixed that by putting a slip lock on here. So that way you wouldn't have to hold the catheter and the needle together. We also put centimeter markings. This is basically a small chest tube. It's a 10 French, which is the equivalent of a 10 gauge. We put centimeter marks. And on the distal end, we put a bunch of little fenestrations, a bunch of little holes. So they invent that the, the distal end of the catheter gets occluded, you would still get some air release out of here. And then this little soft blue tip right here, we put on, it's a very, very flimsy blue tip. So that way in the event that you do come into contact with a lung, it's not gonna completely shred the lung. And then we put this little one-way Heimlich valve on here, um, which basically just allows air to escape, but does not allow air, air to enter. This is just a device that's out there. There are other devices that are out there. And the, the most important thing is whichever device you carry, become an expert in it, know how to use it. The anatomic landmarks are identical regardless of the device that you use. You just want something big and we probably know that we need something a little bit longer to take care of our friends who are not so skinny, okay? So let's go through an anterior needle decompression here. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna find the true midclavicular line. The midclavicular line starts lateral to the sternal notch. And if you, if you kind of put your finger in your sternal notch and you run your finger just lateral to that, your finger falls into this little joint space. That, there's a ligament there, the sternoclavicular ligament, and that forms a joint, the sternoclavicular joint. That's where your clavicle actually begins. Your clavicle doesn't begin right in the middle of the sternal notch. So to find the, the, find the outermost, she's gonna put her fingers on the acromioclavicular joint and then she's gonna put her other finger on that sternoclavicular joint, and then she's gonna bring her index finger halfway back. That is the true midclavicular line, has nothing to do with the nipple line, not even on me. I do not have a big chest. My midclavicular line is actually medial to my nipple line. So that was kind of a trainingism. Oh, just follow the nipple line. Well, nipple lines vary, as I'm sure we all well know. If you put your thumb on the AC joint and your middle finger over that sternoclavicular joint and bring your index finger halfway back, that's the midclavicular line. So that's one landmark you're gonna find. The second landmark is if you feel down on your sternum, you go just below your manubrium, you're gonna run your finger over a bump. That bump is called the angle of Louis. The second rib originates off the angle of Louis, but your ribs come out like this, they come out and up. So when you find the angle of Louis, you don't want to follow the curvature of the second rib because that would put your needle too high. You want to find the angle of Louis and then come straight out on the thoracic cavity. When you do that, you'll be on top of the third rib. And that's where we want to go with the needle is in the second intercostal space right over the third rib. So where those two lines intersect, X marks the spot, that's where you're going to do your anterior decompression. So She's going to use her, her thumb and middle finger to kind of put some tension on that skin. Uh, another modification we made to that spear was we made the, the needle into a scalpel. So it's really, really sharp because some people have a really, really thick hide, a really, really thick epidermis. And sometimes you have to take that, that scalpel, that needle, and make a little nick in the skin to be able to get the shoulder of the catheter through it. You notice how she is staying perpendicular with the patient's chest. The chest is convex, just like this. So she's, she's actually perpendicular with the chest. If she were to angle that needle to the left, she would now be perpendicular with the ground and that would be incorrect because she could inadvertently put that needle and touch that vascular bundle underneath the second rib and that would cause a whole host of problems. So she's gonna go through epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue, and then she's gonna get to the point where she's actually touching the rib with the tip of the needle. That is oh so critical to success in this procedure. You got to find the rib. So once that needle is on the rib, that's why we put those centimeter markings there. You would just simply count back three centimeters, which is actually 1.1 inch. And then when you navigate, staying perpendicular and staying midline, when you navigate over, whoops, when you navigate over, you're just going to put that needle in until your fingers stop you. That will put your needle one inch into the chest. Your needle need, be, need be no further than that. Go further than that, then the in, you're increasing the risk of complications of hitting a lot of major vasculature. So now at this point, she's getting air back and you're hearing air movement. What she's gonna do is she's gonna angle that whole catheter towards the patient's feet or the, the proximal end, which puts the, 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 the catheter threading north. 
you always want to thread your catheters north. She's going to thread that catheter towards the middle of the clavicle on the side of the chest that she's decompressing. And the reason why you want it to do that, you don't want to thread your catheter straight in because if you do, when that lung starts to re-expand, it can either cause injury to the lung or it could kink your catheter. And now you're not getting any air movement. Rather, you want your needle or your catheter running parallel to the lung. So that way when the lung re-expands, it basically just pushes that catheter against the parietal pleura. There's no need to tape this in place. There's no need to secure it in place, but you have to make sure that that catheter is running parallel with the lung. Then what she can do is she can disconnect her little one-way Heimlich valve and then just dis, uh, connect that on the end of her catheter and it makes a noxious, noxious little whistle. And you're just simply gonna monitor your patient. What you might consider doing is when you put that needle in, you thread the catheter, because remember the needle has to stay no more than one inch. So you're gonna stabilize that needle and thread the catheter off just like you're starting an IV. You just care, you just care about getting air out of there. So when she hooks up that Heimlich valve, she's gonna instruct her patient to cough. And when you ask the patient to cough, that causes transient little increases in intrathoracic pressure, and it helps expel air quicker out of that catheter, which equates to faster lung reinflation and quicker hemodynamic improvement. And for those of us that have done needle uh, chest decompressions, the, the clinical turnaround is actually pretty rapid. Once you start getting air out of the pleural space, man, their color looks better, their sats come up, their end tidal goes down, they become less tachycardic, their BP comes up. I mean, the clinical turnaround is actually quite impressive. What about, okay, so uh, I should probably show you what not to do, okay? So these are obviously very poorly placed. The clinician, and, and I'll be honest with you, had no idea where he was going. So we just started putting needles in the chest. And, and this is on a traumatic arrest. You can see the, uh, the imprint from the Lucas and you can see this, this bullet hole right here. So, I mean, this is, this is way, way too lateral for the anterior chest. I don't even know what the heck he was trying to do here, but all of these catheters never made it into the chest and most of them kinked. So this was a complete failure of bilateral needle decompressions. And we typically do that on traumatic cardiac arrests, especially when there's evidence of thoracoabdominal trauma we want to put needles on both sides of the chest to rule out a tension pneumothorax because when we go back, when all is said and done, if I had to look this man's wife or daughter or son in the eyes, I want to be able to tell him or her, your dad did not die from something that was preventable. They did not die from one of the leading causes of preventable death, and that's tension pneumothorax. So don't do what you see up here, but I'm just showing you what really, really bad technique looks like. What about the lateral chest? Can we put a needle in the lateral chest? And the answer is absolutely. In fact, there's a body of evidence to support you're probably better going laterally than you are anteriorly because just statistically speaking, you're more likely to be successful on the lateral chest wall. Well, if you recall in an earlier, uh, earlier we talked about uh, where we should be listening for breath sounds. If you just grab your pectoralis muscle and dig your fingers in where you feel ribs, about where your third finger is, that's where your needle's going to go. Your third finger, and in this case, his index finger or her index finger, puts her at the fourth or fifth intercostal space, which is either the fifth or the sixth rib. You're totally okay going over the fifth or the sixth rib. You just won't want to go any lower than the sixth rib because now you're potentially hitting like, uh, well, I don't know, things like spleen on the, on the left and liver on the right. So she's going to identify that pectoralis muscle. She's going to dig her. You can't be afraid to dig your fingers in there and feel rib. And then she's going to spread her fingers apart. She's going to tension that skin between her thumb and her middle finger. So that way she can roll her index finger in there and definitively reacquire the rib. Once she's spread that skin like that, she can't move her hand because if she does, all that anatomy shifts and she may inadvertently put the needle too low or way too high. And then obviously, of course, you're going to clean, 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 get some chloroprep or whatever, because we're introducing something into the chest wall. So now you'll notice now she is still perpendicular with the chest. She's still perpendicular with the chest. Oftentimes we are over our patients. And if your needle is too acutely posterior, then you're going to navigate that needle right behind the scapula and you will never make it into the patient's thoracic cavity. Conversely, if your angle was too anterior, then you would navigate that needle and catheter right underneath the pectoralis muscle. And the end result is you would never be in their chest. 
So make sure that whether you're anterior or you're lateral, that you are perpendicular with a chest wall. So she's gonna go in until she touches rib. She's gonna count her fingers back three centimeter marks and she's gonna navigate that needle right over until her fingers stop her. And then just like she did on the anterior chest, she's gonna angle the tip of that catheter the when she, when she threads it, it's gonna go towards the middle of the clavicle on the side that she's decompressing. And then she can attach a little Heimlich valve. Now the Heimlich valve, when, uh, when we were going through the, the, the product development and the phase development of this, we asked ourselves, do you really need a Heimlich valve for a needle decompression? And we came to, kind of, kind of, came to the conclusion, it's a nice idea to have. It gives you that audible sound of you getting air out of there. But if that thing falls on the floor of your ambulance, I gotta be honest, I would not waste a half a second looking for it. I really wouldn't, because I just want the air to come out. And there's no way that that patient is gonna preferentially suck air through a 10 gauge catheter because air is gonna follow the path of least resistance. It's gonna move in through their nose and mouth. If you happen to have the Heimlich valve, sure, throw it on there. If it falls on the floor of the ambulance or the ground, man, they'd find Jimmy Hoffa's body before they find your little Heimlich valve. I wouldn't waste a half a second looking for it. So anyway, and then you're gonna, again, instruct your patient to cough and just monitor them. Sometimes these catheters get occluded. If they get occluded and the patient tensions back up again, then you're gonna to have to put another needle in there. If you're on the lateral chest wall, it would be better to go an intercostal space higher, not an intercostal space lower, because this man's spleen is sitting right about here and we don't wanna puncture his spleen. So if you're on the lateral chest and your first catheter either fails completely or it worked initially but gets occluded, then go one intercostal space superior. If you were on the anterior chest, say you decompressed up here, and same thing, your needle, it ca your catheter worked initially, but it got occluded, then you wouldn't want to put another catheter just lateral to the first one. You never want to go medial because now you're getting into the heart box and a lot of really, really important vasculature, and you just don't want to tear that up. So here's some videos that, uh, that we did where we pulled some chest plates back. And just to show you how toxic the tip of these catheters can be to the lungs, <clears throat> to show you that, you know, if your angle's not correct, that one, your catheter can kink. And as that lung starts to re-expand, I mean, the tip of the catheter, it's not dull, it's sharp. I mean, I, maybe I'm just a special person, but I, I've actually cut the tip of my finger just with the catheter before. And that takes special skills to do that. But you can see how that catheter is buried into that lung. We can fix that by making sure we're always parallel with the lung. This shows us more of a lateral view of that same thing. And every time that patient breathes, you can see how that catheter starts to bend and it starts to kink. So you really want a kink resistant catheter. They do make catheters that are kink proof but you really want at a minimum a kink resistant catheter because it would be a shame to do a picture perfect needle chest decompression only to have the catheter kink and worse, it goes unchecked and the patient rapidly deteriorates. Now you're doing CPR on them. So now you are working a traumatic cardiac arrest. And, and, and we all know that the, the, the end result of that is, is just typically not that good. So know your anatomy, find the anatomy on yourself find the anatomy on your loved one. I would go up to my wife or your husband or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your child and pretend that your child or your loved one is your next patient. And if you had to put a needle in their chest, could you quickly identify the proper anatomic landmarks? Because if you do this wrong, you can kill a person. I mean, or in some cases, keep them dead, right? So there's only one pathway mitigation to attention pneumo, and that is to get air out of the thoracic cavity. Some of you that's that are listening to this may have the clinical authorization and the training to put in a chest tube, which is just simply putting in a bigger tube to be able to get more air and, and cases blood out of there as well. But you really need a pleurivac system if you're gonna be doing that in a pre-hospital setting. Most important thing is get the air out of the chest. But what if there's blood in the chest? What if the patient doesn't have air in their chest? What if they have blood? Well, your needle's not gonna fix that, unfortunately. That patient needs blood and they need a surgeon. And preferably in that order in the, in the shortest turnaround, uh, turnaround time possible. So the a question that we commonly get asked is, okay, so I think the patient has a tension pneumothorax and I put a needle in their chest and I thread the catheter and, and, and I'm successful in the procedure itself. But when I pull the needle out, just blood starts pouring out of the catheter. My advice to you, if that happens, just pull the catheter out because you should be beating tracks for the highest level of trauma center that you can possibly reach. 
And if you carry whole blood, and I really hope you get to a point where you do, you're transfusing blood while you're making ways so that guy can get to a cardiothoracic surgeon. A needle is not going to fix a hemothorax because the central problem is hemorrhage, ongoing non-compressible hemorrhage. Some other hemorrhagic causes, a cardiac contusion, a direct penetrating injury to the heart or blood vessels, a pericardial tamponade, and of course the hemothorax that we talked about. So really, I mean, the hemothorax, I mean, it's a similar pathophysiology to attention pneumothorax, but there's not air in the pleural space, there's blood, and your needle's just not going to work. So yeah, let's say you put the needle in there, you, you pull the needle out, you thread the catheter, and you just get blood that's pouring out of there. So some people say, well, at least if I'm getting blood out of there, I'm releasing some tension. It's like, no, not really, you're not, because that's not the central problem. The central problems are bleeding in their chest, and you can't stop that anyway. So if you just keep the catheter in there, you're just going to make a bloody mess in the back of your ambulance. You should be focusing on things like transfusing blood, if that's available to you, and getting that patient to a trauma center. If anybody that's on this, it's, 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 at this conference has ever broken even one rib, you'll readily agree it hurts like a booger to breathe. Even to take a normal breath, it hurts. Imagine if you had a rib fracture like this. So this is a flail chest. And, and I would go so far as saying this is a flail hemithorax because essentially the entire left side of this guy's chest is separated from his chest cavity. If you recall back to your initial training, minute volume is a product of tidal volume and respiratory rate. So if your tidal volume goes down, such as what's happening here, because that whole flail segment is collapsing into his lung when he's trying to breathe in, that's going to reduce his tidal volume. In order for him to preserve minute volume, he has to increase his respiratory rate. And that's why he's breathing fast. That's why he's tachypnic in this. So when you look at this type of injury right here, he's, here's even a gnarlier flail chest. So when you look at this injury, you have to ask yourself, what would I do for that? Well, to appreciate where we're at right now, sometimes we have to take a little jaunt back in history. I'm going to date myself. I went to EMT school in 1985. And in 1985, we carried five-pound sandbags on our ambulances. And we were taught to put a five-pound sandbag on this big flail chest. And the intent was to stabilize the injury. And we did that because I was 18. It's like, sounds legit to me. And you seem like you're smarter than me. So that's what we did. And guess what happened when we put a five-pound sandbag on an injury like that. Our patient said, oh, I can't breathe. And we said, I'm following my protocol, sir, please lay still. And we did that. We did that for a number of years because we actually thought we were doing something beneficial for the patient. Then it was realized, you know, a five pound sandbag, probably a little bit too heavy. So then we graduated to a liter bag of either lactated ringers or normal saline. Just throw a liter bag of saline over there, kind of stabilize that flail segment and your patient will feel much better and they'll thank you for it. So like, okay, seems legit. You seem smarter than me. So we did that. Guess what our patients did? They said, oh, I can't breathe. I'm following my protocol, man, please lay still. So we did that for a number of years, completely fruitless. Then we moved around to this era of put a bulky dressing on it, right? Just put a bulky dressing on it and tape it to the chest, but don't circumferentially tape it to the chest. Guess what we're at now? We're not doing anything to restrict chest mole movement. For the love of God, no five pound sandbags, no liter bags of saline or lactated ringers, not even a bulky dressing. You don't wanna do anything to restrict chest wall movement. So my primary concern with a patient with an injury like this, first and foremost, is inability to ventilate. That's gonna be compounded by the immense amount of pain that this patient is experiencing. He's not gonna to want to take a deep breath. He may not wanna take a normal breath because it hurts so bad. He's purposely going to breathe shallower. He's going to reduce his tidal volume. And that's, a, that's just a natural instinct to pain to the chest. You don't want to breathe very much. That's going to further lower his tidal volume, and it's going to further compromise oxygenation. So that's my primary concern. My secondary concern is pain. So what, what I've done for patients like this, and what I would definitely do from him, for him, is I would give him some ketamine. I would give him some IM ketamine in a dose of around 0.3 to 0.5 per kilo, a sub-dissociative dose. At that dose, it's not going to collapse his airway. It's not going to stop him breathing. It's just going to make him, a, it's going to make it a little less uncomfortable for him to breathe. So that way, maybe he can kind of augment his own tidal volume. If that takes care of the problem and his sats are looking good, his entitles are looking good, man, we're going to the hospital. I ain't doing anything else for you. Because what I really don't want to do is I don't want to push air into your chest. 
I really don't want to do any kind of invasive positive pressure ventilation. And we all need to agree that with an injury like this or any thoracic injury, no mechanical ventilation device. Worst comes to worst, you should be hand bagging the patient. But even at that, I don't want to do that. What this man has lost, in addition to tidal volume, in addition to the pain that he's in, is he's lost a lot of intrinsic PEEP. He's lost end expiratory pressure. That's the residual pressure on the alveolar wall at the end of exhalation. In essence, it's what splints the alveoli open. It keeps them from collapsing, so that way they can continue to exchange gases. Well, every, every place that that flail segment is collapsing into his lung, he's not getting alveolar expansion because he's lost his PEEP. So he's getting widespread atelectasis or alveolar collapse. An effective way to restore that is with non-invasive positive pressure. I'm thinking CPAP. So I would give him some ketamine, make it a little less uncomfortable for him to breathe. And I would start him on about 2.5 to five centimeters. I'm not gonna start high, because I mean, after all, it is still positive pressure ventilation. It just happens to be non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And I'm gonna try to recruit more alveoli so this man can continue to oxygenate because that needs to be fixed in an OR and I'm not gonna put anything on and I'm not gonna do anything to restrict chest wall movement. So be nice to your patients. They're hurting, make it a little less uncomfortable for him to breathe. I wouldn't give him Versed. I wouldn't give him any benzos because those can suppress his respiratory drive. Ketamine at that low dose is not going to have any impact on the patient's respiratory drive. All right, so we talked about a refill problem being a tension pneumothorax. What if I told you pericardial tamponade was also a refill problem? So this picture you're looking at on the left, obviously a, a post-mortem picture, you can see the pericardium right here. And this is just a, a huge hemorrhagic tamponade big hemorrhagic tamponade. So imagine that you take a big concussive wave to your chest or a penetrating mechanism, be it an ice pick, a bullet, whatever, and you tear an epicardial artery. Or worse, you penetrate a chamber of the heart. So now you're bleeding out of your heart into your pericardial sac. That pericardium, I guarantee you, does not expand. It does not yield. It is a tough, tough fibrous sac. So now you're bleeding into your pericardial sac. That pressure is gonna to try to exert outward, but it can't because the pericardium is gonna stop it, which means the pressure exerts inward and that crushes the heart, prohibiting it from expanding. If the heart can't relax, it can't refill. So once again, you have a refill problem. The treatment for that imminently is a pericardiosynthesis to be able to put a needle underneath the, uh, the um, a xiphoid process, and then angle it towards the, the tip of the scapula on the left side. Now, as you can imagine, that's a higher risk procedure. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can kill anybody with any medical procedure that's done incorrectly, but there's a risk of, of lacerating coronary arteries. There's a risk of lacerating other vasculature. There's a risk of, of going through the pericardium and actually entering the myocardium. If it wasn't already injured, now it is. So that, that, th this does take some more specialized training and not every EMS agency has clinical authorization to do that. But that is truly what the patient needs. But if we can't do that, what can we do? I'm thinking Frank Starling, the Starling's Law. Starling's Law says that the more volume you return back to the right side of the heart, the more the heart stretches. The more the heart stretches, the more forcefully it will contract. That's a stopgap at best but that's about all you may be able to do for the patient. Because this is not a, it's not that the patient's bleeding to death, it's that the heart is being crushed and their venous return is just not there, which means their left ventricular output is not going to be there. Beck's triad is a trio of findings that are, uh, that are considered to be classic for a, a tamponade, distended uh, neck veins, muffled heart tones. I gotta be honest with you, <laughs> they all sound muffled to me because you're trying to listen to the heart through the chest. And it takes a lot of practice to truly appreciate a muffled heart tone. But in some cases, you might hear the heart tones are distant. So of these three findings up here, I think that would be the least practical because it's the most difficult. Distended neck veins, if the patient's body habit is such where you can see that, remember, they should be positioned at a 45 degree angle to truly appreciate that. So I could appreciate that and also a decreased or narrowing pulse pressure. So imagine that if the heart is not allowing, it's, it's not being allowed to relax, then your diastolic pressure is going to go up. 
But if your cardiac output is going down because left ventricular output is diminished, your systolic pressure is going to go down. So basically, you get a narrowing of your pulse pressure. The only way that you're going to appreciate that is to trend the patient's blood pressure over time. Some patients present with tamponade, and it's not, it's not classic. They don't have the distended neck veins, but they have some chest pain. There's a mechanism that would suggest potentially uh, a cardiac injury. And you take their, their blood pressure and you trend it over in like you know, maybe five or 10 minutes. You notice, hey, this guy's systolic is going down and his diastolic is coming up. If you have the patient on the cardiac monitor, which you absolutely should, you may see a phenomenon called electrical alternans. And that corresponds basically with a heartbeat. And that's a change in the amplitude of your QRS from beat to beat, which is compounded when you breathe. Because if the heart's already being crushed, now you have the element of inflated lungs that further restricts the heart from moving, and that can lower your amplitude. Another finding may be uh, a pulses paradoxus, and which roughly equates to about a 10 to 15 millimeter drop in systolic blood pressure every time you inhale. So unless you're monitoring the patient's blood pressure in real time, like with an arterial line, I think a really good surrogate for that would be find a pulse. And when they breathe in, note if their pulse markedly weakens or disappears. If that's the case, then you've identified pulse as paradoxes. So let me bring up this next slide here. So if your patient's in shock and they have JVD, but their breath sounds are clear, that's a tamponade until proven otherwise. And it should be treated as a tamponade Unless you can do a pericardiosynthesis on the side of the road, you need to get that patient by the most expedient means, it may be air, it may be ground, to the local trauma facility so they can fix that person up. In the interim, you can try some blood or you can try some, uh, some IV fluid to, to try to increase preload. So these are some, uh, some chest x-rays of big, big tamponades. You can see this one over here on the left. All this is blood. All this over here is blood. So just imagine um, all of this going on behind the scenes, and that patient is literally basically trickling blood out of their left ventricle, and that's why these folks are so hemodynamically unstable. This is, a, it may be a little grainy if it is, I, I apologize, but this is a tamponade under ultrasound. You can see all of this area up in here, this is all blood, and you can see how cardiac diastole, when it relaxes, is being restricted, because this heart should have been coming up here and touching that pericardium, but because all of this is filled with blood right here, it's limiting the heart's ability to be able to do that. So if you if you're if you do poke us point of care a point of care ultrasound, um, this would be a really really useful tool uh, to look at the heart for evidence of tamponade, and and you can even pick up tension pneumothoraces and things like that. So what do we do? Pre-hospital rapid transport. You may try fluid boluses. Exercise Starling's law. If properly trained, put a needle in their heart, specifically their pericardium, and draw that fluid out of there. The hospital, they're gonna do what's called a pericardial window. They're gonna do a sternotomy. They're gonna crack the sternum in half, open it up. They're gonna open the pericardium. They're gonna evacuate the blood. They're gonna find where the blood's coming from and either plug that hole with their finger, or I've even seen them put a Foley catheter in a, like a, a penetrated right ventricle or left ventricle, inflate the bowl and then pull it back, and they're straight to the OR. If pulses are lost, then that patient may need what's called a resuscitative thoracotomy or the proverbial cracking of the chest. And this is a picture that we took up on our lab. We just finished a study that compared the left anterolateral thoracotomy, which is I think what we, we typically see them do in the emergency department. They'll, they'll split from left side of sternum down to the, the left side of your chest and basically open that. Well, we, we did a, a research project comparing that approach to what you're looking at on your screen, which is a modified clamshell thoracotomy. And that's basically cutting from one um, side of the chest to the other and lifting all of this up. And we found that it provided better access to the emergency physician to be able to reach in there, open the pericardium, deliver the heart, inspect the heart for injury. And if there's no injury to the heart, then they're gonna go in there and cross clamp the aorta and that patient's gonna to go to the, uh, the OR if they restore pulses on them. Clearly this would be well beyond the purview of a paramedic. However, um, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that paramedics may be assisting a physician if that physician is one that rides with EMS or if that physician is kind of like a roving doc and shows up at your call or your patient's in traumatic cardiac arrest, they may actually do a roadside thoracostomy. Your job would be limited to that of helping to retract and maybe reach in there and move lung tissue out of the way to give them better access.
So if your patient has a traumatic cardiac arrest and they're doing this, what we did find basically looking retrospectively at research was that if you have a penetrating mechanism and you get a thoracotomy in short order, the survival rates are actually upwards of 40% from a penetrating injury because a penetrating injury, it's focal. They can find it. They can fix it, take you to the OR. If you have a blunt mechanism, then your chance of survival, even with a timely thoracostomy or thoracotomy as it were, or, or less than 5%. So, you know, when you, we put all this together, we have to think about the cardio the cardiac effects of this. So, I mean, if the heart's being squeezed, the heart can't feed itself. So in addition to the refill problem, you can get diminished coronary perfusion, and that could basically create essentially global cardiac ischemia, which could induce, you know, almost like it looked like a STEMI on the EKG, even though it's a different pathophysiology. So chest injuries, we must be able to recognize them. The only way we can recognize them is to have a systematic methodical approach to be able to pick up and find these injuries, first injury found, first injury fixed, know when it's time to put a needle in somebody's chest. So our scope of practices differ from locale to locale and from state to state, but of three things, of three interventions that are out there, three life-threatening injuries that any one of us who, who is certified as an EMS provider should be able to do. One is to give epinephrine for anaphylaxis. And I think we all have a mechanism to do that. Number two is stop the bleed. We all have to have a mechanism for doing that. The third is to be able to treat attention pneumothorax. So in BLS systems, and, and Texas is a delegated practice state, which means that our medical director can train us and delegate us to do whatever he wants us to do. Now, it's not like he'd have me do a C-section or a craniotomy. That would not go well for me, let alone the patient at all. But I truly believe that a needle decompression is something because that is such an eminently treatable and reversible cause of death that I think that if properly trained, I think the more EMS providers would be able to do that, especially those who work rural EMS, where they may not have rapid access to a paramedic. And, and if they don't get a needle in their chest, that patient is not just going to improve on their own. All right, folks, I really appreciate um, uh, I really appreciate the conference folks having me up to, to speak or having me down to speak. I'm not up there, I'm down here. I thank you for your attention. Here's my contact information, my email address. I'm on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. I'll follow you back. If there are any questions, hit me up in the chat box. If you want to send me an email with questions, if you want any of these training materials, I will gladly share anything that I have with you. But for now, I appreciate your attention, and I want you guys to be safe out there. Great. Have a nice day.